Hello, this is Dr. James Strickler, and this lesson concerns Chapter 14, The Civil War, in the United States history textbook, American Yop. The first issue to discuss in this chapter is that of secession. In other words, the southern states leaving the United States of America. The impetus for the southern states to resign from the United States of America in effect and form the Confederacy was the establishment of the Republican Party, which they saw as a threat to the institution of slavery that their economy and their way of life was built around. Now, the Republican Party didn't really understand why the South was so threatened by them. Yes, they were an anti-slavery party, but they were also an anti-abolition party. Now, what is meant by that is the Republican Party's official position was that slavery should not expand to anywhere where it wasn't already in existence. But the places where it did exist, they would leave it alone. The southern states simply did not believe this. They thought that if slavery was not allowed to expand to the new territories, that eventually there would be an, ant an overwhelming anti-slavery majority in the country that would end the practice of slavery in the South, regardless of what the Republican Party may have intended in the beginning. Republican Party in mind, the Democratic Party held its national convention in Charleston, South Carolina, in the heart of slave country. There, though, they couldn't agree on what position to take. Many members of the Democratic Party from the North didn't want to come out strongly in favor of slavery. So, the pro-slavery Southern delegates left the convention. They would come back a few days later and nominate their own candidate for president, a man named John C. Breckinridge from Kentucky. Weeks later, the Democratic Party would try again, holding another convention in Baltimore, Maryland, this time without the Southern delegates where they chose what they felt was a compromise candidate, Stephen A. Douglas of Illinois. Stephen A. Douglas came from an anti-slavery state, but he was not as uh, vehemently against slavery as other people were in the North. There was a feeling that he might be able to bridge the two sides, but it proved that, that the time for such compromise was past. Meanwhile, another political party formed this was called the Constitutional Union Party. It tried to ally Whigs and Southern Democrats who were not wanting to end slavery, but also wanted to oppose the idea of secession. They wanted to defend the Union without having to address the issue of slavery. This was business as usual, just trying to go along with things as they were and hold the country together. They nominated a man named John Bell from Tennessee for president. It was then the turn of the Republican Party to hold its convention in Chicago. It took great effort for them to find a candidate that they could agree upon. <clears throat> Eventually, they settled on a compromise candidate, Abraham Lincoln the man who had unsuccessfully challenged Stephen A. Douglas for the Senate in Illinois. Lincoln was a persuasive speaker, and he was viewed as a person who might be able to walk that important line of being strongly against slavery, but maybe not threatening the South enough that he could actually win the election. Well, the South nonetheless viewed him as a great threat. Even though he explicitly said he did not want to end slavery in the South, but merely wanted to prevent its expansion to the territories, as we've discussed before, that was not good enough for Southerners. Southerners were afraid that if they were not allowed to expand slavery, eventually they would become a distinct minority in the country and their practice would be outlawed. So, to try to fight back, they actually excluded Abraham Lincoln and the Republican Party from the ballot in their states. Every state that would eventually go join the Confederacy, with the exception of Virginia, did not allow Lincoln's candidacy to be on the presidential ballot in 1860. 
when election time came, the, they had the highest turnout in American history. Over 80% of eligible voters showed up to vote. And Lincoln swept all the free states. The sla states where slavery was practiced were divided among the other three candidates. This gave Lincoln the victory in the Electoral College. He was elected president despite receiving only about 40% of the popular vote. Lincoln's victory was then seen as a direct threat to slavery. Southern states saw his election as an indictment from the rest of the country, that the rest of the country was going to come after their slaves. So beginning in South Carolina, the southern states began to vote to secede, or in other words, to leave the Union. South Carolina held a convention to consider this possibility, and the final vote there was 169 to nothing to leave the Union. After South Carolina, several other states immediately followed across the Deep South. Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, and Florida joined them in resigning from the Union. These rebellious states then gathered together in Montgomery, Alabama to reorganize themselves as a confederacy. They wrote a confederate constitution and elected their first president, a man named Jefferson Davis. Montgomery, Alabama, where they held this convention, served as their temporary capital for a short time before it was moved to Richmond, Virginia, where they thought it would be permanently. Even though these states were, by their own acts, leaving the Union, there was still hope in Congress that some sort of compromise could be reached to bring them back in. This was led by a senator named John Crittenden. He was in a committee of 13 senators who tried to work out some sort of compromise that could be used to keep the southern states in the, the Union. Crittenden's compromise consisted of a series of constitutional amendments that were designed to forever protect the practice of slavery. His own committee did not approve them, and when they were put before the full Senate, they failed there also. Well, this happened before Lincoln actually took office, that the states began seceding and Crittenden's compromise failed. When Lincoln actually was sworn in as president and gave his first speech, he essentially tried to, in a sense, ignore secession. He maintained that the South was still part of the Union and it was illegal, invalid for them to leave, and that the U.S. government would continue to maintain its properties that might be in the South. Lincoln's pledge for the federal government to maintain its properties in the South is what directly led to the beginning of war between the Union and the Confederacy. One of those properties was a fort, Fort Sumter, in the Bay of Charleston, South Carolina. The fort was built there to protect shipping going in and out of the harbor, to defend the harbor. Southerners saw it potentially as something that could be used against them to stop them from using one of their busiest ports. And they also found it offensive that this other country was maintaining a fort within their boundaries. They demanded that the fort surrender, and when it didn't, they attacked. And within a day, it in fact did surrender. Well, the, the state of South Carolina openly shooting at a federal facility could not go unanswered. In response, Lincoln called for volunteers to come out to defend the Union. Within a short time, 75,000 troops had volunteered to join the United States Army to fight against the rebels. But who would command these 75,000 troops? Lincoln offered the command of the U.S. Army to Robert E. Lee. Robert E. Lee was a colonel who would have been elevated to general. He was considered a military um, tactician of great renown, a great leader of troops. Remember, he is the one that had captured John Brown at Harper's Ferry. Robert E. Lee turned down the opportunity. He was from Virginia. 
even though he didn't think that the southern states should be seceding, he said that he could not lift his hand against his own state and his own people. So he resigned his commission in the U.S. Army and would eventually become the leader of the Confederate troops. After Lincoln actually took office, then the Upper South joined the Confederacy. States like Arkansas, Tennessee, North Carolina, and Virginia, believing that there was no opportunity for a compromise left. War then was upon us. And General Wilf Winfield Scott, the man who had become famous during the Mexican-American War and had previously ran for president, suggested a strategy to defeat the South. It became known as the Anaconda Plan. The idea was to encircle the South and strangle it, the way a constrictor snake might. This would be done by cutting off all the southern waterways. On the coast, this would be cutting off ports like Charleston and New Orleans. But inland, it would be taking control of rivers so that the South could not do trade amongst itself or with other countries. This is a way to constrict it, to economically harm the South and eventually defeat it that way. The question then became, what would the border states do? Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, and Delaware. They were all slave states. Would they join the Confederacy? Well, remarkably, they did not. They remained loyal to the Union throughout the war. Now, there might have been fighting within them, at times, they weren't unanimously in favor of staying within the Union, but they did not join the Confederacy. And Lincoln's ability to keep them in the Union was a major boost to the Union efforts to eventually bring the whole South back in. Now, you may notice on this map that West Virginia is also colored. West Virginia was not yet a state. West Virginia was part of the state of Virginia. When the state of Virginia seceded, what happened was West Virginia's five westernmost counties, which were anti-slavery, um, refused to go along with the rest of the state. They would eventually be brought in as their own state, the state of West Virginia. But at least initially, they were not a state, they were just rebel counties from the rebel state of Virginia. Now remember, that the U.S. economy in the lead up to the Civil War was based on the harvesting and processing of cotton. It wasn't just the southern cotton fields that relied on this, but also northern mills. And the cotton economy crashed as the war got going. Cotton couldn't be grown and harvested. The mills shut down. So it was a bad economic time for both North and South. The advantage that the North have that we previously mentioned is it had a bunch of manufacturing facilities that could be potentially turned to the war effort. The South did not. The first significant battle of the Civil War was the Battle of Bull Run, fought near Washington, D.C. This was so early in the war that many people thought that the war was kind of a joke that it wouldn't really go on for a long time, that the federal army would easily defeat the, federal, the, the Confederate rebels. And so as their two armies initially met outside Washington, D.C., people actually came out from the Capitol in their horses and buggies and brought picnic lunches to watch the battle. It did not go well. It was, in fact, a resounding Confederate victory. This woke people up to realize that the war might not actually be e easy. The Battle of Bull Run was the first significant battle in the Eastern theater of war. This is where two great armies fought in and around the, the capitals of the two warring nations. Richmond, as I mentioned a moment ago, was the capital of the Confederacy. Washington, D.C. was the capital of the United States of America. They are not very far apart from each other. Their armies danced around these two capitals, each seeking the opportunity to capture the other throughout the war. It never happened, but this is what occupied these armies throughout it. One of those armies, the army on behalf of the Union, was named the Army of the Potomac. Its leader was a man named George McClellan. He eventually compiled 120,000 volunteers in his army. It was huge, and he was incredible at building that army. 
What he was awful at was actually using it. He was far too conservative, far too unwilling to sacrifice it. He built a beautiful thing that he did not want to see destroyed, and this ended up being his undoing. Meanwhile, it was opposed by the Army of Northern Virginia, led by Robert E. Lee, who we've already mentioned. Robert E. Lee had half the troops of the Army of the Potomac at his disposal, but he was aggressive, he was brilliant, and his troops loved him and would do anything for him. This gave him a great advantage in the battles that took place in that eastern theater of war around the capitals. McClellan was so against directly engaging um, Lee's army in northern Virginia that he foolishly set out on what became known as the Peninsular Campaign. He marched his troops from Washington, D.C. to the Chesapeake Bay, put them on boats, and shipped them down the coast to the, to the coast of Virginia. There he unloaded them and marched them on the Confederate capital of R Richmond, hoping to outflank the Confederate armies and enter Richmond from the south without even really having to fight a battle. He was wrong. He was very slow, very cautious, gave Lee plenty of time to get ready for him. And in fact, he was forced to retreat when he finally attacked Richmond. It was a humiliating loss for the United States as, as he withdrew his troops back to Washington, D.C. At the same time, battles were going on elsewhere. There was the Western theater of war in places like Tennessee and Mississippi. It was primarily concerned with controlling the rivers inland through which trade could go up from the coast throughout the Confederacy. A major battle fought in that Western theater of war early in the war was the Battle of Shiloh, in which 23,000 men were killed or injured. This was the most massive and bloody battle in American history to that point, with more casualties than the country had ever seen. This shocked the nation about just how brutal this war would end up being. Yet despite setbacks in those um, inland battles such as the Battle of Bull Run, the United States had an advantage along the coast. The US Navy was superior to that of the Confederacy and they used that advantage to attack the port of New Orleans and capture it. This was a great blow to the Confederacy because with the end of the Mississippi River now shut off to them, there were many places in the Confederacy that now had no trade with the outside world. As I said, the U.S. Navy had a big advantage over the Confederate Navy. But one of the more famous battles that actually was fought to a draw was between two ironclad vessels, the first vessels ever in world history to be covered in metal which made them impenetrable to the cannonballs at the time. One was the USS Monitor, a ship representing the Union Navy. The other was the Confederate States of America, Virginia, representing the Confederate Navy. It was previously a, a ship of the United States Navy that had been taken over by the Confederacy and re-outfitted and renamed. So sometimes you hear this battle referred to as the Battle of Monitor versus Merrimack, but it was actually Monitor versus Virginia. That was the name of the Confederate ship. Both ships were covered in metal and they couldn't sink each other. But this was a preview of things to come. Eventually, all navies all over the world would be made out of metal ships. But this shows how technology advanced during the Civil War, and this had a huge impact. Some people characterize the American Civil War as the first modern war because of the mechanization of weapons and the brutality of the tactics used. As the war got going, one of the important questions to be answered it was, what would happen with the slaves? Would they be freed? There's a word for this that we've used previously in this course, emancipation. An early example of the potential emancipation of slaves in the war was the actions of a commander, a Union commander, as he entered the South and began finding slaves in areas that he conquered what to do with them. 
when their when their white masters ran away as the Union armies advanced and the slaves stayed behind, what do you do with them? He regarded them as contraband of war. His reasoning was, if their southern owners treated them as possessions, then they could be taken as possessions in war. Just as an army coming in and taking over a village might ransack the grocery store for food, he thought he could also ransack the plantations for their slaves in a sense. Well, his practice was eventually given, given legal sanction by Congress passing what was called the Confiscation Act of 1861. Now, this created a kind of strange legal limbo for the, the slaves, though. They were no longer the property of their masters. They had been seized by the Union armies in that sense. But the Union armies didn't want them either, as I'll explain in a moment. Nor were they granted their freedom in the equivalent of white people. They were not slaves in the sense that a specific person owned them anymore, but they were not free either. Later, a second Confiscation Act was passed in 1862, which required that anyone who had taken up arms against the United States, who did not surrender within 60 days of the passage of the Act, would lose any slaves that they owned. But this loss of slaves would actually be done through a criminal proceeding where they would be prosecuted for their rebellion against the United States, and if convicted, their punishment would be losing their slaves. Which meant that it was kind of a theoretical forfeiture, a theoretical confiscation. Um, you are not having slave masters captured and put on trial and their slaves freed in that way. But it was a direct threat to the slave owners. It was letting them know what would happen eventually if they would lose the, the war, that they would lose their slaves. So as the northern armies eventually advanced through the south, there became this question of what to do with the freed slaves. As I said, they were already referred to as contraband, and they end up following the Union camps. As the armies advanced, the slaves followed them. They didn't want to be back on their farms where they had been slaves. They didn't know what to do. And the Union armies didn't know what to do with them either. They were prohibited from actually doing anything with them. But nonetheless, they did on the sly. They paid them to do all kinds of manual labor on behalf of the cramps. They, they, the reason they didn't want them is they were legally prohibited from assisting them to be runaways. See, this is a conflict between the Confiscation Acts and the Fugitive Slave Acts and the Fugitive Slave Cause of the Constitution. Remember, we've discussed this stuff in the previous chapter. According to the Constitution and laws passed under that provision, escaped slaves were supposed to be returned to their masters. Well, now the Union Army was the one assisting the slaves to escape, but they weren't really supposed to be assisting them to escape. So this is what left them in a legal limbo. So, could something more clearly legal be done to ensure their freedom? Well, President Lincoln began to consider the possibility of an executive order that would emancipate the slaves, grant them their legal freedom. He would justify this as a war necessity that he as the commander in chief of the army could issue. He would essentially say that as a prosecution of the war, that he, as the commander in chief of the armies, under that power, could order any slaves in areas still being, that are still in rebellion as effectively free. Now, this was a controversial legal position to take. There's nothing in the Constitution that grants a president the power to seize somebody else's property as an act of war. But he was going to do it anyway. It's also legally controversial because he refused to even acknowledge that the southern states were separate states that he was at war with. So what happened was his Secretary of State, William Seward, 
said this is going to be controversial. What we need to do is we need to wait till we have a decisive victory on behalf of the North to kind of get the public's feelings behind us because we've been losing some battles to the South here and people are getting a little disgruntled with what's going on. We need a big victory before you announce this. Well, the big victory sort of came at the Battle of Antietam. The Battle of Antietam to this day remains the deadliest day in American history. In a single day, you had over 20,000 Americans die in one battle. No battle of World War II or World War I was ever this bad. But it was a Union victory. It was a huge battle, obviously, and it was a narrow Union victory, and they decided, well, good enough. We'll use that as our big justification. Hey, we're on the road to victory to then announce the emancipation of the slaves. So Abraham Lincoln issued his order, the Emancipation Proclamation, in which he declared that he as commander in chief could decide that all persons held as slaves in any state that's still in rebellion are thenceforth free. Well, some people mistakenly think this is what freed the slaves in the United States of America. It in fact did not. The reason it didn't was because of its wording. Think about this. Lincoln was freeing the slaves in places that were already, that were still in rebellion, excuse me. Well, if they're still in rebellion, that means the Northern armies haven't conquered them yet. And that means that, therefore, while he may say the slaves are free there, they're not actually free. The Confederates are in charge. The slaves are still at work on their plantations. They don't even hear about this order. They know nothing about it. So it's not really making them free. Well, what about the places that have already been conquered by the Union armies? Well, they are not in rebellion at that point, which means they're, the slaves in those areas are not freed. And what about the, the border states? like Missouri and Kentucky that never rebelled in the first place. Maryland and Delaware, they all have slaves. Well, they never rebelled, so their slaves are not freed either. So Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation didn't actually free many slaves, but it was a huge symbolic act to now change the emphasis of the war. The war had began as an effort to keep the Union intact, to stop the country from breaking up, and it had transformed into a war to end slavery with this Emancipation Proclamation. Even before the Emancipation Proclamation, there were some black troops that were being organized to fight on behalf of the Union armies. A man named Thomas Wentworth Hig Higson from Boston organized some uh, free blacks from South Carolina as a set of troops even before the Emancipation Proclamation as one example. But after the Emancipation Proclamation, black troops, or excuse me, black um, people living in America turned out in droves to support the Union effort, which they saw as an opportunity to free um, blacks just like themselves. About 10% of the Union Army would eventually be um, composed of what they called colored troops, this was the name they used for people of African ancestry at the time. These colored troops, however, were not trusted with combat roles. They were not given guns to go out and fight. Instead, they did beside the scenes things, such as building roads or bridges or providing um, uh, food for the other troops, things like that. They were nonetheless an important benefit to the Northern armies that helped win the war. Well, even as Lincoln is announcing the Emancipation Proclamation and transforming the nature of the war, the Union continues to lose most battles. Another example of this was the Battle of Fredericksburg, a huge battle that was a devastating defeat of the Union armies. Well, this was beginning to wear on people. Now, there were occasional victories, like the slim victory in Antietam, like the, the capture of New Orleans, but for the most part, when the Confederate and the Union armies, particularly in the Eastern theater of war, met, the Confederate armies won. And this got reported in the newspapers. And as a result, the 
thrill of the war began to die down. You weren't getting as many people volunteering anymore. This then led to the first military draft. It was called the Enrollment Act, and it had an out. A person could pay money to get a substitute to go to war for them if they got drafted. This led many people to complain that it in fact was a rich man's war that was being fought because the rich man could stay at home and send the poor man to fight for them. Opposition to the draft became so intense that there was a giant draft riot in New York City. People went to the streets protesting. They ended up breaking things, setting things on fire. 120 people died in the riots. But there was also a racial element that raised its ugly head. Many of the people blamed blacks for the situation. If they hadn't been agitating for freedom, we wouldn't be in this, and so it was their fault. And actually, 11 black New Yorkers were lynched by the mobs as retaliation for what they had, the mobs thought they had done to cause the war. Although initially in the war, the South had great success, eventually the tide turned. Now, the biggest reason the tide turned may be that the North had such an advantage in total number of people and in its manufacturing capabilities. But the South had done amazingly well up to this point. And part of the reason for that is the South just had superior generals. Among them was a man named Stonewall Jackson. During the Battle of Chancellorville, another Confederate victory, unfortunately for the South, Stonewall Jackson was mortally wounded. One of his own troops accidentally shot him and he died. This was a huge blow to the Confederacy. Later, Robert E. Lee, the general of the Army of Northern Virginia, its leader, decided that he needed to invade the North, put more pressure on Washington, D.C., perhaps defeat the Army of Potomac, roll into Washington, D.C., seize the capital, and then the North would be ready to negotiate a peace, which would recognize the Confederacy as a separate country. As he invaded the North, he ended up being met by the Union Army, the Army of the Potomac, at a small town in Pennsylvania called Gettysburg. There they fought for three days. This became the bloodiest battle in American history. More people died than at, than at Antietam, but it was stretched over three days, so Antietam is still the single bloodiest day in American history. At Gettysburg, these two huge armies of tens of thousands of soldiers clashed. And the peak of it was an event called Pickett's Charge, where after two days of fighting on the flanks, the Confederate Army charged the center of the Union line, and a few soldiers managed to break through, but they were repelled, and the Confederacy had to retreat. This is one of their first and only defeats in the war to this point. It was a huge morale boost for the North, and it left the Army of Northern Virginia in shambles. At approximately the exact same time as the Army of the Northern Virginia was finally losing to the Army of Potomac in Gettysburg, the U.S. Army in the Western theater of war was finally taking the city of Vicksburg in Mississippi. Now remember, I told you that the Union Navy had captured the city of New Orleans. But that not, did not give the Union Army control of the Mississippi River. They only had its mouth on the ocean. They still couldn't control trade going up and down the river because there was a city, Vicksburg, which overlooked the river that had cannon that could shoot any ship that tried to go by that they didn't want to go by. And so the Union Army laid siege to it. That means they camped around it, prevented anything from going out, and staged a long attack upon it. Eventually, the siege of Vicksburg worked, the city re re surrendered, and the Union had control of the Mississippi River, thus dividing the Confederacy in two pieces, with Texas and Arkansas and uh, other slave-supporting um, territories on one side and the rest of the Confederacy on the other. 
It wasn't just the, the north, though, that was having trouble getting soldiers and had to draft people. The southern states started conscription also, which is just another name for drafting people into an army and forcing them to serve. In the south, all white males between the age of 18 and 35 were required to take up arms in defense of the Confederacy. But there was an exception. If you owned more than 20 slaves, you were not required to serve. The thought was that you would need be needed to stay home to control those slaves so they didn't rebel. As the war dra dragged on, there were food shortages in both North and South, but they were particularly bad in the South. And in several cities, riots took place. These were called bread riots, and they showed how difficult it was to fight a long-term war particularly when your economy had been built on just raising cotton. You weren't ready to do the kind of things that were needed for a protracted war. Eventually, Abraham Lincoln decided that he needed the same kind of aggressive tactics that were being used to win battles in the Western theater of war to win battles in the Eastern theater of war. Although the Union armies had achieved a decisive victory at Gettysburg, the general over those armies, George Meade, had refused to chase Lee and his army in northern Virginia back across the river into Virginia. He probably should have pursued them and tried to destroy them again, but he was too cautious. He had taken over command of the armies because the previous general, actually a few generals previous, who had first created that army, um, George McClellan, had been even more cautious. Lincoln was had had it with cautious generals. He brought in Ulysses S. Grant, who had been commanding troops in the West effectively, and put him in charge of the Army of the Potomac. Grant then proceeded to engage in what became known as hard war. This is where he wasn't just out to kill the enemy's troops and win battles. He was out to demoralize the civilians that supported the enemy to destroy their economy. As he marched through areas, he tore up railroad tracks and roads. He burnt fields and barns. He wanted to destroy their ability to fight war. As he engaged with the Army of, of Northern Virginia, he would fight a battle, the Northern Virginia Army would retreat and try to outflank, and rather than letting them get away, he would simply move and fight them again. Grant was relentless in his effort to defeat the Army of Northern Virginia. He would never give them a moment to rest, never give them a moment to resupply. He believed that the superior manufacturing and production of the North, the superior number of people that they had, would allow him to eventually wear down the Army of Northern Virginia and defeat it. He just had to be willing to be relentless and he had to be willing to sacrifice his men to do it. Eventually, he chased the Army of Northern Virginia to the city of Petersburg, which is not far from Richmond. There, the Army of Northern Virginia dug in. They dug trenches to try to stave off the attack from the Union Army. And Ulysses S. Grant laid siege again, like he had done in Vicksburg. I can stay here longer, I can fight more brutally than you, you're eventually going to give up, was his way of fighting. And eventually he forced Lee to retreat from there too. Meanwhile, his tactics were continued in the West by William Tecumseh Sherman, who may have taken them to even another level. He was friends with Grant, and he believed in fighting war the same way. William Tecumseh Sherman led his Western armies for the Union to eventually capture the city of Atlanta. As they rode into the captured city of Atlanta, the Confederate troops retreating tried to burn warehouses of goods before the Union could capture them, and the fire spread throughout the city. Some people think that Sherman burned Atlanta just to punish the people. No, he did not set the fire but it probably helped his cause that this major southern city did burn when he captured it. While Grant and Sherman were fighting relentless um, war battles to defeat the South, 
politics was still going on in Washington, D.C. After the southern states seceded from the Union, you were left basically with northerners in Congress, Republicans. They could do anything they wanted. And so they did things besides just pass laws for the war. They passed three major laws that ended up having long-term effects on the history of the United States. One was a land-grant college act where they took territorial lands and gave them to states to use to finance universities on the frontier. Many states now have major land-grant colleges. Most states where you have uh, two major universities and one has state in its name, like for example, the University of Oklahoma and Oklahoma State University, the state one is a land-grant college that came to, into existence through this federal law that granted territory to the state to be used to finance the, the creation of a university. Another law they packed was, passed was the Homestead Act. The Homestead Act granted free land on the frontier, 160 acres, to anyone who had not taken up arms against the United States of America and was willing to go out there and make some sort of improvement to the land. You could go out there and build a sod hut and start planting a few potatoes and that land was yours for free. And finally, they passed the Pacific Railroad Act, which provided funding to build a transcontinental railroad to connect the two halves of the country, from California in the west to Washington, D.C. in the east. They also passed a protective tariff. A tariff is a tax on goods coming into the country. Now, tariffs in some ways are bad because they prevent trade with other countries and they can hurt the economy. But in this case, the government was desperate for money to fund the war. And so they put this tax on things coming in to get more money. They also passed the Revenue Act, which was the first income tax in the country's history. Now, later, the United States Supreme Court would declare income taxes unconstitutional until an amendment was later passed to the Constitution. But during this time of crisis during the war, they passed an income tax and got away with it for a time. Now, they gathered on all this money and spent it. And that has an economic effect. When the government spends a bunch of money, it actually reduces the value of money and leads to inflation. Something else that led to inflation at the same time was the government began to print what is called fiat money. This is money that is not attached to any physical object. Now before this, if you got a, a bill, a piece of money from a bank, as you may have remember learning earlier in the course, you could actually redeem that at a bank for a hunk of gold or silver of equivalent value. These greenbacks that were created by the United States of America only had value because the government said they had value. If you trusted the government, you would use them, but you could not redeem them for any physical object. Well, not everyone trusted them, and so the value of them went down, actually, which that's another thing that leads to inflation. So you have people in the midst of this war, seeing all the brutality of it, experiencing the casualties of it, seeing friends, neighbors, and family members die or come home wounded. Then they're getting drafted to go, even if they don't want to. And now the economy is struggling and inflation is going up. They can't get bread, and even if they can, it costs way too much. People are beginning to turn against the war, and the South hopes that they can still eventually get peace without losing. And they had some allies in this. In the North, there were still Democrats, who in many cases were, were, were what became known as copperheads. These were Northern Democrats that had sympathy for the cause of the South and thought that a peace should be negotiated. Rather than continuing to fight a war, which would harm the economy and harm physically people, they thought that a peace should be negotiated. They were in a sense allies of the Confederacy without being part of the Confederacy. And those who opposed them reviled them for that position. Now, as I said before, Politicians in Washington, D.C. remained busy during the war. They admitted two new states in the years 1863 and 1864. 
One was West Virginia, those five counties of Western Virginia that did not go along with the rest of the state when it seceded. There are some good reasons to think it was unconstitutional for uh, the United States Congress to accept them as a new state, but they did so right about the same time as the Battle of Gettysburg. They also admitted Nevada, a territory in the West right next to California, as a new state the next year. With these two new states added to the Union, the free majority was increased even more. For Southerners, this was just more evidence that they had done the right thing by trying to secede from the Union, but they were losing and they knew it. They were involved in a lost cause at this point. Their only hope was that Abraham Lincoln would lose the next presidential election and that a president who was willing to negotiate peace would be elected instead. Abraham Lincoln tried to get more support by running not as a candidate of the Republican Party, but as a candidate of what was known temporarily as the National Union Party. This took almost the entire Republican Party and Democrats that supported Lincoln's war efforts and bound them together in a temporary political party to win the election in 1864. His vice presidential candidate was in fact a pro-slavery Democrat, Andrew Johnson. Well, I shouldn't say pro-slavery. He, he, he came from a slave state and had sympathies for the South but he supported Abraham Lincoln and the efforts of the Republican Party to preserve the Union. So they put these two different men with different political views together to try to present a unified ticket to the country to win the election. And in fact, they did so. His opponent in the election, a Democrat, was the General George McClellan, who had built the Army of the Potomac, but had been too uh, uh, reluctant to use it effectively and had been fired by Abraham Lincoln. There was a hope that by running a general that they would get the votes of the troops in the election and defeat Lincoln that way. And if they had, George McClellan would have negotiated peace with the South. But he lost and Lincoln remained as president and saw the war through almost to its end. Now let's talk for a few moments about what life was like among those who were fighting the war, just how horrible it was. Disease haunted the camps of both North and South. We didn't have the kind of understanding of disease that we have today, nor the modern vac medicines or vaccines that can be used to fight it. So horrible diseases like tuberculosis and smallpox routinely swept through the armies that were fighting. In addition, other conditions such as diarrhea and dysentery haunted the armies too because of their unsanitary conditions. They would move from spot to spot and just have to dig long troughs as toilets. Here you can actually see at the bottom of the picture the public toilet being used for this encampment. Well, when you've got a bunch of human urine and feces right next door to the tents, inevitably disease gets passed around also. But it wasn't just disease that was causing the problem, the technological innovations. We already talked about the ironclad vessels, but that wasn't the, the most effective part of the technological changes in the war. Instead, they got mobile cannons on railroad tracks, such as we see here. They developed mortars, machine guns, things like that, trench warfare, things that made the war last a lot longer and be a lot more brutal. As a consequence, many people were badly, badly injured in the war. Now, medicine had advanced a little bit by this point in human history. They understood that they could save people's lives by cutting off damaged limbs because the damaged limbs would almost certainly become infected and the infection would eventually spread through the body and kill the person. So instead of leaving the, the crushed, torn up hand at the end of the arm, they would simply cut off the arm at the elbow and save the person's life. So amputations became common and thousands and thousands of soldiers then went home from war, missing hands, feet, legs, and arms. So the war was taking a horrible human cost on people in the country. And that human cost 
was exacerbated not just by the technology and the disease, but by the tactics used. And the most brutal tactics were those of Sherman, the general in the West who eventually marched through the South and to the sea. After capturing the city of Atlanta, he determined to march to Savannah and then turn north and capture the city of Charleston in South Carolina, which he did. Along the way, he practiced hard warfare to its limits. He burned everything of value, tore up everything of value. Remember, the idea was to destroy the South's willingness to fight, and he accomplished that. With Sherman destroying the South and Grant harassing Lee's army to the, in the North till it couldn't fight anymore, eventually Robert E. Lee had to surrender his Army of Northern Virginia to Grant's Army of the Potomac at a place called Appomattox Courthouse. Now, that is actually not the name of a courthouse. It is the name of a town, which was named after a courthouse. But anyway, Lee surrendered to Grant there, and with that surrender, the war was effectively over. It was a war that had brutal lasting consequences for the South. This is a map that shows all the battles fought during the war, and each battle circle represents the number of casualties in that battle. You can see the biggest circle at the top is for the Battle of Gettysburg which had over 50,000 casualties. If you total up all the casualties, you have over 750,000 actual dead people during the war. You can notice that almost all these battles were in the South. So Northerners came to the South in Union armies and died, but mostly these were Confederate soldiers and Confederate civilians dying. The war was brutal for the South just as far as the number of people killed and injured. And that does it for chapter 14 about the American Civil War.